Okay, welcome. Um, I'm glad to see so many people here today for our talk, and I wanted to start out by thanking some people. First, I want to thank the Law uh, and Government Program, the Law and Business Program, the Law and Business Society, and of course, uh, Bernadette Pascal Graffried, who put a lot of work into organizing this particular event. So I'd like to introduce uh, Macon Delrahim. He is the Assistant Attorney General for the Antitrust Division of the Department of Justice. It's a very long title. But what this means is that um, he is the chief law enforcement officer in the United States for antitrust matters. He was appointed by President Trump last year. Um, as the assistant uh, attorney general for antitrust, he oversees all criminal prosecutions that are brought by the US, and he oversees a significant portion of civil prosecutions and, of course, merger challenges, including the controversial AT&T Time Warner deal that I think is actually at trial right now as we speak. He came to the office with decades of antitrust experience. He served as a deputy in the same office he now runs and on President Bush's Antitrust Modernization Commission. He's considered an expert in international uh, enforcement of antitrust law, the antitrust implications of intellectual property, and the appropriate design of antitrust remedies. Please join me in welcoming Macon Delrahim to our law school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Allensworth. It's great to be here. Um, I love the city of Nashville, and thanks to the law school, uh, to Dean Guthrie, uh, Lawrence Epstein on your board, and others uh, who have uh, invited me here. Um, and also, a personal thanks to not only you, but to the law school for, uh, for the brain trust we have in the front office of the antitrust division. Some of you may not be aware, but uh, Taylor Owings, who is here, one of our counsels in the front office, was a uh, law school grad uh, of 2013. Uh, Renee Augustine, one of our senior counsels and a colleague of mine from my service on the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, is, uh, is in our front office and I believe was a 91 grad and uh, their deputy assistant attorney general for economics, who's our chief economist, is uh, Professor Luke Frobe who is on loan from you guys from the Owen School, and uh, he's a, a phenomenal addition. I'm sure there might be others within our staff, but certainly our front office leadership is populated by Vanderbilt law grads. Uh, you guys, I think, are giving NYU a good run for, uh, for the folks we have in front there. Uh, it's great to be here, and I thought what might be helpful instead of uh, any kind of a policy speech for some of you is explain what the antitrust division does, some of the issues of why uh, it is a great area that some of us have chosen to pursue, um, and some of, the, some of the exciting issues that are now pending before the Supreme Court, uh, the courts, and some of the policy uh, issues that we are pursuing at the antitrust division. Would that be a good way to proceed? That sounds proceed? great. Great. So within the uh, Justice Department, uh, we are one of the divisions uh, of the antitrust division, about uh, approximately 100 years old, uh, that enforces the antitrust laws. About 40% of our work is criminal enforcement uh, of the antitrust laws and 60% on the civil side. And the civil, we share that jurisdiction with the Federal Trade Commission, depending on the industries um, that, w that we deal with. Uh, within the civil, we uh, pursue uh, and evaluate conduct, such as about 20 years ago, the antitrust division brought the lawsuit against Microsoft uh, for monopolization. Uh, we also uh, review mergers uh, under Section 7 of the Clayton Act. So antitrust, I think, in a nutshell, can be, not to preempt a great class that you teach here, but can be broken down in about, you know, in three buckets. Section 1 of the Sherman Act, uh, which is the, you know, the concerted action uh, that makes uh, both civil and criminal violations. Uh, for example, these are price fixing, bid rigging, and market allocation between competitors. Uh, those, those are pursued criminally, and um, uh, we take that very seriously. Section 2 of the Sherman Act is monopolization, and that's a single firm. That's when one company does certain things to try to exclude competition, and uh, the allegations in Microsoft 
were that they were trying to keep the internet browser um, that some of you all have lived with, but for a number of us, that was a pretty recent invention, uh, was, uh, was, was they were trying to keep it out of the market so to not um, uh, impose on the monopoly they had on the operating system uh, in personal computers. Uh, and then lastly would be Section 7 of the Clayton Act, which are big mergers, and you know, big and small mergers are reviewed under uh, Section 7, and we look to see if there's substantial lessening of competition under the uh, statutory regime. Uh, we, uh, the Antitrust Division also gets involved in some uh, areas, which I wasn't aware of until my last service in 2003 when I joined the division, which are under the Hobbs Act. These are regulatory agency rulings. So the Federal Communications Commissions, when they come, you know, they have a rule such as the net neutrality rules or the uh, FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has various rules dealing with electricity or nuclear energy. Those economic regulatory issues are delegated, uh, their, their defense under the Hobbs Act, when the US government defends them, it's the antitrust division that gets involved with uh, defending their rules along with their legal departments, but a lot of them don't have their own independent litigating authority. Um, with, uh, with some of the issues I wanted to touch on, the Supreme Court has heard oral arguments and is reviewing a very important case that the uh, Solicitor General's office uh, uh, was involved with, and it deals with, a, with an antitrust division case um, against uh, American Express. And it is certain rules that they would have uh, that would restrict merchants from advertising or um, steering is what they call them to lower cost credit cards. So if you know Visa only charges a merchant two percent and Amex charges three percent, uh, you as a merchant who accepted American Express cards, you couldn't tell the consumer coming in that hey, if you use Visa, it'll be a percent cheaper. Um, the antitrust division took the view that that, is, that violates the antitrust laws because it raises the ultimate price to the consumer. And um, they brought a case, division, uh, several years ago, one in the district court in New York. It was appealed. The Second Circuit said, now wait a minute. These are two-sided markets. Uh, we're going to take a look at both the consumer side, the card issuing side, and the merchant side, the businesses who accept. And we're going to take a look at the whole thing in one market. Uh, the state of Ohio, uh, one of the state attorney generals who uh, was involved in the litigation, appealed it to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court granted cert. Uh, at that point, the antitrust division filed an amicus, which is an interesting dynamic given it's the antitrust division's original case, um, where we uh, urged the court to overturn the Second Circuit, and they got it wrong. Why is that case so important? Because you're going to have um, it will set the rules for a lot of new business models, what are called two-sided markets, that a lot of you probably have used today, uh, Uber and Airbnb and others. And the, the question will become, when the Supreme Court sets the rules, can you, what can they do? Can, um, can you uh, impose certain restrictions that limit competition on one side of the market, but can benefit the overall market because it has some positive effects on the other side. And so uh, the, the Solicitor General's office, with whom we work closely, uh, uh, filed a, an amicus brief, set a certain test, and uh, had the deputy SG argued before the court in, in what will be a, a, one of the most critical uh, decisions that the court will issue, and it'll be the first one that the new justice, uh, Justice Gorsuch, will have participated in, in an antitrust case. And he himself was an antitrust lawyer, an antitrust litigator uh, in private practice. So it'll be very interesting. We're watching uh, closely what happens in that case. Uh, we obviously have had uh, a number of high profile mergers, uh, a couple in the healthcare industry, several in the media industry. Uh, we're in litigation on one. Um, in Washington, D.C. that is going on right now. And uh, it'll be uh, interesting because of the potential impact 
that some of these uh, enforcement decisions will have on the future of uh, certain businesses, particularly in the areas of uh, vertical integration and what should be the rules uh, that apply to that. Uh, on an area of policy that we have, uh, uh, we are embarking on is a review. One of the first things I wanted to do to come to the division was looking at consent decrees, consent decrees in antitrust cases. We looked, we have 1,300 current consent decrees on the books, the antitrust division. I semi-joke that a lot of these consent decrees are alive and kicking, whereas the industries are, have been long dead. And we have consent decrees on music roles, and this is what people can do in the business of selling music roles. I don't know how many of you are in the market to buy a music role, but I don't know uh, if that consent decree really has a lot of relevance. Um, some of them, you know, I think somebody said that there's a, a consent decree on buggy whips, uh, but we have a lot of them. We have some of them that are very relevant to our everyday lives. For example, since 1948, there's a set of consent decrees uh, that govern uh, how you see movies. This, uh, these are what are called the Paramount Consent Decrees. There's a handful of them. And the way movies are distributed in movie theaters are governed by those consent decrees with the antitrust division still enforced by a court someplace. Music. The music industry is governed by uh, a couple of consent decrees. In uh, ASCAP and BMI, they have offices just a couple of blocks away from here. Uh, this is the town of music. And um, those are what are called PROs, performance rights organizations. And copyright is such a statutory mess that it is, you know, you probably can take three years of copyright law and still not know every uh, aspect of copyright law. But the way music is licensed and uh, uh, has been governed by these consent decrees since 1941. So 77 years of a consent decree, rates being set by a judge um, in what's called rate court, as opposed to free market competition. And, um, we are taking a look at that. Uh, there was recent litigation in the Second Circuit, uh, dealt with Pandora. I would encourage anybody who's interested in either music or the law or antitrust law to read, uh, not, probably not the Second Circuit they just affirmed, but a very lengthy district court opinion um, that gives some background of that case and is incredibly well written. Um, so without commenting on, you know, uh, the substance of it or its interpretation. Uh, it is a great background about those. It's Pandora versus ASCAP. Uh, and it gives you a nice background uh, of what the DOJ has done and how that industry has evolved. So you have, you know, music that has gone from bandstands to vinyl to cassette to CDs to big CDs to small CDs to the 8-track to MP3s. Um, to music streaming, which is probably how most of you are listening to it on Spotify or Pandora or Apple Radio or something like that. But that whole innovation and that whole process um, has occurred in the music business and the technology that delivers it. But the licensing of it is still governed and the whole ownership uh, process is still governed by these consent decrees for 77 years. And you know, I think as public agencies, we need to take a look and see if these consent decrees are still relevant in the marketplace. If they have solved the competitive problem, uh, they could become anti-competitive tools uh, over time if they still exist. If they were you know, not necessarily the best ideas at the time, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for them to stay. So we're you know, engaging in a review of all consent decrees, uh, whether they're relevant or not, and we will see where we go uh, with those. But that's a, a, a live project. We have now reviewed, my last report was two thirds of all those consent decrees. And um, uh, some of these are fantastic. I mean, from an academic standpoint, I hope that some university wants to take a look at them because these are agreements written by the division 
and businesses that go back 100 years, and we have the original agreements. They've now been digitized and put in a database, the court, the market, the industry, the violations, the terms, um, and the division has really undertaken a, a, a huge uh, endeavor to uh, make sense of them. Uh, and then we will begin uh, uh, perhaps uh, sunsetting some of them that don't make a lot of sense and reviewing and seeing if we are the, the appropriate authority to continue to enforce and, for lack of a better word, regulate such markets. On that last point, I, I kind of view my role as a law enforcement antitrust laws as law enforcement. It's law. We have to take a look to see if somebody is violating that law. Uh, consent decrees are intended to be a settlement of a, of a, uh, of a violation. You try to fix the market. Uh, Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson, who pr prior to being on the court was, um, was the head of the antitrust division for FDR, um, gave a fantastic speech talking about how antitrust is law enforcement. You try to fix the market, and then let the market decide who wins, who loses. Let the market decide what are the rates that should be uh, determined in particular transaction, in you know, arm's length transactions. Uh, we are not competent to, despite what some of us might think, uh, I'm just of the view that we're not competent to try to determine the future of technological development or different markets um, and try to craft long-term consent decrees that substitutes our judgment for the better judgment of the free market system. Uh, and, and uh, you know, and also micromanaging. We're not many regulators like the FCC or FERC or Department of Transportation or others. Uh, that's not what Congress has empowered us to do. Uh, we, so we try to enforce the antitrust laws. Um, and I kind of cringe every time somebody says, you're a regulator. I'm like, mm, no, I'm a law enforcer. Uh, when we start doing regulation by consent decrees, uh, that's when we should know that we've done something wrong. So with that, I uh, hope that's a, enough of an overview. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, about the division, some of our work, and uh, any other things that you guys want to talk about. So that's fantastic, and I, I think the primer on antitrust is appropriate because most people here haven't taken my class, something I hope you all fix next year when I offer it in the spring. Um, I'd love to get questions from the audience. Uh, if there aren't any at this moment, I might start off with a question of my own and then hope that you know, by the time we finish talking about this, you will have formulated your great question and be ready to ask it. So the AT&T Time Warner merger is controversial in part because some people see it as the first vertical merger that is being challenged in a major way in 40 years. Um, so I was wondering, and yet, vertical mergers have very anti-competitive effects, say a lot of uh, policymakers and uh, economists. I think we're seeing that especially in the tech industry. So um, two questions there. One, could you speak a little bit, perhaps not to the specifics of that case, but about how vertical mergers can harm competition? And then also, am I right that this is a, a, a brave new policy on the part of the DOJ and we can expect to see more uh, heavy enforcement um, of vertical concerns going forward? Uh, so let me first say, I hope you would uh, accept my apology first, but not being able to comment on the matter that is in court. The judge has been very clear and admonished us not to comment about uh, the transaction, and we're now in the court. We'll let that process handle itself. With respect to some folks who might say that um, you know, any enforcement of vertical merger law is somehow you know, a new... Um, scheme that has been conjured up by me or others, um, Congress amended the Clayton Act in 1950 to explicitly state that vertical mergers are treated um, are right under the same Section 7 legal standard as any other transaction. Um, so that's one. Uh, two, one of our predecessors, uh, Deputy Assistant Attorney General John Salad, last November gave a speech that's on the website that discusses the various vertical merger enforcement actions um, just because a matter is not litigated. And the antitrust division maybe litigates, it goes to court, maybe four or five cases because usually you have good antitrust counsel that advises you about transactions, behavior, 
and uh, the, whether it's horizontal or vertical or diagonal or perpendicular, they are uh, you know, addressed. And uh, because it hasn't been litigated, doesn't mean there hasn't been enforcement. So Salitz, uh, even as one, I think it was uh, KLA was the case, uh, where the parties abandoned it. That was a vertical merger where the antitrust division uh, was reviewing and uh, raised objections, and the parties abandoned. So sometimes you abandon, sometimes you sell off assets, sometimes uh, you uh, don't see it as a problem. So I think uh, I just want to be sure nobody is, uh, is somehow uh, confused that antitrust laws don't apply or the last 50 years have not applied to uh, vertical mergers. Uh, they have, and I would refer to the salad uh, speech about that. Any questions? Yes. By the way, this is Miss Staples.